it's still true that 95% of our lowland species rich grasslands have been lost. Uh, and, you know, that, that's a huge sort of, huge marker that we shouldn't forget. I know it gets repeated a lot, but it's a really important thing that we've still got a lot of work to do to get the habitat connectivity to where it needs to be for the species that rely on that. In Worcestershire alone, we've got 20% of the remaining neutral grasslands in England. There's a similar pic picture in Herefordshire and Gloucestershire as well. And we've targeted work on, on areas like Beckenham Forest, uh, which is one of the main hotspots in Worcestershire. Um, and often in this sort of landscape, you've often got small, small sites, few acres, but it's the real jewel in the crown type sites that really, it's in, you know, you go into these meadows and it's incredible. Some of them have got up to 200 species in them. You just don't see anywhere like it. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're incredible places and, that, and actually taking people to visit them is one of the best ways of um, <coughs> getting action on that. Um, the trouble is we, we're, already, we're already losing them. So that those 95% that have gone and the five that are left are being lost all the time. And a recent assessment in Worcestershire just showed uh, how much uh, the damage is ongoing. And we're seeing that through the environmental impact assessment process, where a lot of that's it's not really protecting the species rich grasslands at the moment, unfortunately. And so that really gives us an impetus to do something. And I think that when we're talking to farmers and we're trying to encourage them, uh, you know, it's, it's, a good, it, it's good to show them that, you know, because they, they know that what they've got is precious. If we know what we've got to precious, we're going to look after it. We're going to make sure there's more of it in the future. Uh, look a little bit at some of the opportunity mapping we did. A lot of talk about data today. I think it's really important, though, that we don't let data uh, rule our lives. And it doesn't, although it, that we use data to manage what we're doing, to assess the effectiveness of what we're doing, but we don't sort of get lost in it. This is a really simple map we produced in the Forest of Beckenham area. Um, where you can see all the little grassland sites and they're surrounded by a 500 metre buffer. And obviously where they meet between two sites will be up to a, a kilometre apart. And that, we use that buffer by looking at research that showed that the common pollinators in particular would travel about two kilometres to another site. Uh, so we were looking at sort of some of the, the less common pollinators and, and trying a halfway house of that kilometre where they meet gave us a picture. But what I want to say as well is that we don't then look at that and say, right, well, we're going to target this gap or this gap or, or whatever with our work. What we do is we've got our project area and we accept any habitat creation within that area. And then when we look at it again in five, ten years' time, and this map will be populated with far more sites, it'll be a lot more joined up. Um, and I think that's important because you can waste time focusing on areas where you might not have much momentum. It might be a lot harder going getting into certain areas than others, and we've got to go, um, you know, where where our impact is going to be more effective. So that's important not to exclude areas. And that's just looking at the Worcestershire <coughs> map, and you can kind of see the concentration we've got in the Forest of Beckenham on those say looking at those grassland sites. Uh, we've also got other concentrations where there's other work ongoing. And in fact, working with people like <coughs> Caroline and Worcestershire Wildlife Trust. Uh, and the facilitation fund group that she's set up, which is doing amazing work, we're able to con contact and, and uh, what Caroline is to, to get the work to happen. One of the examples we had this year, or sorry, last year, was um, we got a call about midday. There's some green hay available. Um, can you? I mean, they've had three or four farmers within their facilitation group come on, come together. We met at about 7 p.m. when the bales arrived, and we all went out and spread that that evening. That into, the, into the dark, uh, spreading that because it came around. But that wouldn't have been there if we hadn't had a facilitator there to find the availability and let us know about it. So it's important to have that contact. And I think getting things to happen and doing things together is really important if we're going to actually uh, move things forward. And it, and it motivates participants to stay involved as well. Um, we've then expanded those areas, including Worcestershire. We've got further. Uh, Facilitation groups in Herefordshire, uh, Caroline Hanks has done amazing work there. We've got 53 members, I think, in Caroline's group. She's done incredible work. And, and you know, when I'm up here talking, I'm really talking about other people's achievements. It's not, it's not mine. Um, and then in the Sherborne area, Rebecca Charlie's done amazing setting up that group there. Um, you know, and it's, it's made a real difference. So 
And I think I talked a bit about the data. I'll just skip through some of that because we've got only so much time. Um, so with farmer led, farmer funded, does that help with the ownership? And certainly with the Martin Down Cluster, there's an element of that. And something we've discussed is whether the farmers are going to put, uh, put their own money into doing this. We're also looking for other funding, and there's been drip, drip of any money and other bits and pieces. You know, if you're doing something interesting, if you're making things happen, then money gets attracted. I think the Martin Down Cluster were even looking at some of the, um, uh, the match funding they could get from charitable trust and the like. Um, and I think looking at, we've got some members who are really looking at some innovative ideas. So if they're going to try something that's going to benefit maybe growing a new crop, growing a cover crop, whatever that is, um, you know, trialing some grass management techniques, could they get some crop insurance or something like that? Um, you know, they're proposing all sorts of ideas whether we could benefit from biodiversity offsetting as a group. But talking about all these income generation opportunities that working together brings helps people to see the benefit of that. And I think that's the real action demonstrated with, with, with data. It's, it's about getting things done. And if you're working with farmers, that's what they want to see. They want to see, if they've got their name to it, they want to see that things are actually happening. And it's not just you know, a talking shop. There's actually progress being made. Um, just want to say a little point on countryside stewardship, um, or stewardship as a whole, or whatever the iteration is. It's so important, and I think, um, it's important to say that all the work we've talked about today relies on this funding. Every bit of habitat, I think pretty much all the habitat work, there's a couple of mentions of farmers doing stuff themselves, but the bar, this is a big income stream for a lot of farmers, and we must make sure that when we're feeding back to policymakers, we're not saying cluster farm projects are a replacement for this, there's something that adds additionality to this. This is really important. And if you think about what a stewardship scheme is, it is already an outcomes approach. You know, you know, we've got an area of payment for delivering a certain habitat type, particularly on the grassland options, um, and that provides an outcome in itself in having that species-rich grassland. You know, if if it was easy to administer and you got paid on time, we'd all have not a problem, would we? So, it's, I think it's one of those things that that's those are the things that need remedying the scheme. The actual options are good. We can make the the prescriptions a bit more flexible. Um, and I think that would be a lot easier for farmers. We'll see some of that. I think really important that we shape our priorities <coughs> with the farmers. It's quite often we do think, you know, we say this is what we're going to do to a landscape. And I think for farmers that can be off putting. I've been involved in schemes where I've come into a project and that's a farmer's come to me and said, I've seen the project map, my whole arable farm's going to be woodland. You know, we have to be careful <laughs> about how we approach things. And that's where we don't let the data drive us too much, but we use the data to measure our success. I think that's really important. Also important, I think, to look at new practices and, and things that are taking off within the clusters, because that's kind of what people like talking about. And we can see um, you know, great benefits from people making business decisions that benefit the environment. So you're not just doing wildlife around the edges of the field, <coughs> that we're actually combining and making that more of a holistic system. And one of those uh, practices that we've seen taken off in lots of different places now, the rotation of grazing was mentioned in the last talk, but is holistic plan grazing. And that's making your grazing decisions based on your environmental, your financial, and also the social implications of that. Like the farmer's family, the amount of work they've got, all sorts of things. And, that, and it's, it's a really useful and powerful tool. But you can see in this picture, we're grazing right through the flowering period. We're leaving a lot of flowering heads behind. A lot of what's been grazed off is going to reflower, and then you've got a nice rest period for everything to come back. Low impact on the soil because you've got short duration of grazing. And this allows management of sites where haymaking is perhaps not an option, or as we've just heard, where it might be preferential to just to have different stages of growth, almost like a coppice rotation in a grazing situation. It's a guy called Simon Cutter in Caroline's uh, facilitation group, who's unrolling bales of wildflower meadow hay onto a less species rich site. And there's a little loophole you can do in your HMS prescription to just stick <coughs> nicely to your advisor. I didn't say that. Um, that allows you to do that. But again, flexibility in prescriptions is what's needed so that people can innovate and do this sort of thing. Simon's seen a huge increase in the wildflower content of his meadows. He's feeding his cattle over winter. He's saving on wintering costs. He's making his business more resilient. He's improving the environmental benefits to his own farm as well. It's a win-win-win. Um, we've got farms on uh, 
coming in, putting here's a farm that came on the, on the plus they put in 180 acres, the whole farm went into restoration. But another farm this year put in 600 acres, another one put in 300 acres of species rich grassland, species rich meadows. And I think important, if you have big results, you don't go and walk around 600 acres of species rich grassland that's been created, it's an impressive thing. And it motivates people when they see, see these things happen. The guy who says he's making no money out of arable farming, he might as well put it in. Um, he might as well put it in, improve the soil condition, and enjoy what he's doing, bought some cattle to start again. Um, you know, can have a big impact. This is Eads Meadow Triple SI. It's one of the most species rich meadows uh, in England. Uh, incredible species list. Um, and we use green hay from this site, and we've taken that to lots of other um, <coughs> sites around Worcestershire. Increasing, there's about, you go to this site, you see 10,000 green winged orchids in here. <coughs> but interestingly, in the initial scoring and stewardship, this 38 Triple SI wouldn't get in. The current scheme has to have a special case. So again, it's about sorting out the, uh, the administration side to help us make things happen. And then on this site that we did some restoration, this the first year there was one green winged orchid, the second year there were 84 green winged orchids, and then we'll see what happens next year. Other innovations, looking at saving costs on wintering outside, uh, making the most of uh, saving on straw costs, but also maybe having sacrificed paddocks that and we can work with cost compliance, we can work within prescriptions to make sure this sort of thing works. Increasing our margins, reducing costs on forage systems. If we're going to go to a post-subsidy world, what's a livestock system going to look like? I don't think it's going to be as a, you know, we farm 420 acres of pedigree in Aberdeen Angus. I don't think it's going to be a high input system down the line. If you look at New Zealand, it's very forage based, it's very low cost, low risk system. And we've looked with farmers in different areas about looking at improving gross margins and by having these low cost systems these sorts of decisions are just as important i haven't heard much talk today about the business resilience other than getting grants in of how we can integrate environmental practices that actually improve our business performance as well finishing cattle off grass where we find actually by skim grazing as you saw in that previous picture we're actually selecting the best forage from that and, and the nutritional take as research <coughs> the nutritional take of those animals is equal to the best ryegrass lay. So we can get performance from these species rich meadows, which is really important. This was holistic grazing group I'm working with in Scotland. There's two groups in Scotland we're working with. Um, and you can see, I think in this room there's about uh, 40,000 acres altogether. So a group of farmers comes together, it can make a huge impression. And on the Balkasky estate near Fife, where we're looking at their holistic grazing, in practice, raising through the winter, reducing their costs, got 150 million cows on this site. You know, 10,000 acre estate makes that leap, commits to improving the environment, and the neighbours start looking at that, and they can see the cost savings, it makes sense, it's important. And, and then the environmental side is, is intrinsic as part of their business, not something that's tacked on for a grant. Lots of benefits there. So these are about, I can't go into all the stuff about holistic grazing at the moment, but there's so many benefits when you focus on the environmental side and the productivity side. It makes sense to a farmer's business, but it makes sense in terms of improving the environment as well. I can't stress that enough. And we're increasing the productivity of grasslands. Fertility is often a bit of a dirty word when we talk about species-rich grasslands, but I know people like Matt Wilmot's here today, I'm having a chat to him, and I know he's established wonderful wildflower margins on very fertile ground. Just because you know, the decision test says no doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. We should do bold things that work. Um, and I think if we keep telling people that grasslands shouldn't be productive, we're not going to have many wildflower grasslands left. <coughs> How are we doing for time, James? Okay. Um, low barriers of en entry for young farmers as well with these systems. Um, <coughs> you know, you can set up on a 200, 400 acre farm for 500 quid, some electric fencing and some movable water troughs. It's really simple to start. You can start with other people's cattle and I think it's really important that a lot of my friends and, and people who are starting out in agriculture, there's not a lot of easy ways in at the moment and we need that energy and those people coming into the industry and it's another way if we can bring people in 
with, with a system that works economically and one that works environmentally, it's more attractive. When, when I grew up in our, in our farmhouse, and I, was, I just heard bad news about animal health, bad news about disease, bad news about the economics and prices and what's going on. My kids grew up, you, you know, and they're, they're out counting orchids, they're seeing the health of the cattle, they're seeing a demand for grass-fed products. You know, and that positive story within our communities is really important. And we can't keep the people aspect out of it. This is about family farms. And I think one of the most important things about that is that, you know, what is the future of our rural landscape at the moment? You know, is it, is it we're just going to, we're not going to look at Brexit, we're not going to look at what's going to happen post-subsidy. Is there a place for family farms? And do we think that we're going to have a better chance of conserving our environment with family farms or with corporate agriculture? Um, we've got to think about how that policy mix is fitting, and I think we need to do everything we can to help family farms be productive, and that's not through high-risk systems, in my opinion. But these low barriers of entry um, and ability in a low-risk system is, is makes a big difference and it's great fun when you feel like you're moving forward rather than you're always struggling. I think important to say something as a farmer said to me, I sort of stole from them and they, they came up, well there's a, there's a place for a wild flower meadow on every farm and I think that's absolutely <coughs> true. Um, that traditional mixed farm is, is kind of what we've lost and that's what the specialisation, that's actually led to what we've lost in terms of the wildlife as well. Um, arable field margins are a wild flower meadow, and I know farmers who are actually using their, wild, their existing wild flower meadow to establish new arable field margins by seed harvesting, saving themselves on a seed cost but still getting the pain. So saving money in that sense, and it makes a big difference. The green hay that we use and we take from the really nice meadows, and we, we use that to make more meadows, that has a really big impact. Uh, it's increasing the amount of resource that we have for pollinators and wildlife, all of that. And then the species rich hay feeding that we've been promoting locally uh, in, in a couple of areas in Gloucestershire, um, in Worcestershire as well. And we've seen that you, you struggle to buy. Is that two minutes? <laughs> two minutes. <laughs> We've got curlies everywhere, the species rich grassland. <laughs> but we struggle to buy. Uh, species rich hay now. There's a market for species rich hay because people can get in their prescriptions and they can start unrolling bales, feeding through the winter, keeping cattle out longer, saving on wintering costs because we're, we're aligning our environmental objectives with their business objectives. And that's led to a market demand for species rich hay, creating a value for something that is of environmental value. And I think that's where potentially the outcomes of approach could help because it's not an England for gone. So if it helps you financially, it doesn't have to be considered by the policy maker as something or they don't have to fund. They can still fund on the outcome and you can still have an um, uh, uh, economic benefit from that. Spring turnout was what wildflower meadows used to be used for, so there was always a big rest period. So all of these things can add, add value and have, have great benefits. Um, I also just want to touch on the benefits, of the, you know, we talked earlier of, of the fact that the nutritional take can be just as good. We're also learning about the benefits of having all these different species within a sward now. All those different deep rooting herbs bring up different minerals and they actually provide a better nutritional profile, mineral profile for the animal. And all this time when we're talking about trade deal with America and we're worried about growth promoters in cattle, recent, recent research shows that that diverse sward has exactly almost the same impact as that growth promoter within the rumen of the cow, because it has an antibiotic impact which increases the efficiency of that rumen. So the growth promoter they're using in the States, we've got natural ones in this country, they're called wild farm animals. Thanks very much.